In this tutorial, we'll discuss when series are said to be convergent and divergent. Let's start by writing out your typical geometric series. It starts with a number, here we'll call it a, and each term in the series is equal to the previous term times the number r. So we have a plus ar plus ar squared plus ar cubed and so on, up to a times r to the n. First off, how many terms are there in this series? Let's start counting. This is the first term, this is the second term, this is the third term, this is the fourth term, and we can keep going. The thing to notice is that the number of the term is always one more than the exponent of r. So if the exponent of r is n, that means the term is n plus 1. So the number of terms here is just n plus 1. Right, there are n plus 1 terms here. So if this were a longer series, then this sum would be partial sum number n plus 1, or a n plus 1. The first partial sum would be just a by itself. The second partial sum would be a plus a r, which are the first two terms. And a n plus 1 is the sum of the first n plus 1 terms. Now let's see if you can remember what the sum is for a geometric series. Given the numbers a and r, which of the following is a formula for this sum? This formula was actually derived in another tutorial. Go back and check it out if you forgot. But a sub n plus 1 is equal to little a times 1 minus r to the n plus 1 over 1 minus r. It's that answer there. Okay, now let's see an example. Here's a geometric series. 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16 and so on, up to 1024. These are powers of 2. Try finding the sum of this series. In order to use this formula here, we need three things. We need little a, little r, and little n. Little a is easy. It's the first term. This is little a. So let's just write that down. Little a is equal to 1. Little r is the ratio between terms, so we can pick two terms, say 4 and 8, and use them to find little r. We just take the bigger term, and divide it by the previous term, and we get r equals 2. The last thing we need is little n. Little n comes from the last term. The last term is 1024, so let's write that down. a times r to the n is equal to 1024. But we know a is 1 and r is 2, so the left side here is just 2 to the n equals 1024. And that means n is equal to the log base 2 of 1024. That's 10. So now we know little n, little r, and little a, we should be able to find the 11th partial sum, because little n is 10, we want big A sub 11. What's big A sub 11? Well, it's little a, which is 1. The numerator is 1 minus 2 to the 11. That's 10 plus 1. And the denominator is 1 minus 2. There's a minus sign in the numerator and denominator, so we can flip the order that the subtraction is done for both of them by multiplying the top and bottom by minus 1. And we're left with 2 to the 11th minus 1 on top, which is 2047, and 1 on the denominator. That's just 1. So the answer for this partial sum is just 2047. Exactly, 2047. For this geometric series, a, the first term in this series, is 1, and r, the ratio between the terms in the series, is 2. So for a series in which r equals 2, what happens to the partial sum a n as n gets really, really big? What happens to the partial sums as n gets really big? 
Well, let's write a few down. A sub 11 we just found was 2047. What's a sub 12, the next one? Well, it's just this sum here, plus 2048. If we add that up, we'll get 4095. The next one after it is basically doubling it again to get something close to 8,000. A sub 14 is close to 16,000. Every time we add 1, every time we find the next partial sum, it seems like we're doubling the number. So what happens is n gets really big? Well, a sub n seems to go to infinity. Right. The partial sums go off to infinity. Let's look at some of the partial sums for this series. a1 is 1, a2 is 1 plus 2, which is 3, a3 is 7, a4 is 15, a5 is 31, and if we skip ahead to a11, it's 2047. Each partial sum is more than twice the previous one, and they get infinitely big if you keep going. Let's look at a second example, one that behaves a little differently. Can you find the sum of this geometric series? To evaluate the sum, we need to find little a, little r, and little n. Little a is the first term, which is 1. Little r is the ratio between terms, so we can take that term divided by that term, for example, to get 1 eighth divided by a fourth, which is a half. And to find little n, we need to look at the last term. The expression for the last term is a times r to the n, and in our example, that's 1 over 1024. We know what little a and little r are, so if you plug those in, we get 1 times 1 half to the n equals 1 over 1024. Another way to write the left side is 1 to the n, or 1, divided by 2 to the n. And the right side is 1 over 1024, which means that 2 to the n is equal to 1024. And if we take the log base 2 of both sides, we find that n is equal to 10. Now that we know little n, little r, little a, you can plug them into the formula to find the sum. Yeah, so for this one, r is equal to a half. For geometric series in which r equals a half, like this one, what happens to the partial sum a n when n gets really, really big? Well, what are the partial sums for this sequence? Little a is equal to 1, that's the first term, and r is equal to a half. That's the ratio. So the n plus first partial sum is just 1 minus 1 half to the n plus 1, all divided by 1 minus 1 half. What happens as n goes to infinity? Well, this term here is just 1 half multiplied by itself many, many times, n plus 1 times. If you keep multiplying 1 half by itself, you eventually get very, very close to 0. You don't get all the way there, but you get very close. So this is 1 minus 0, and the limit as n goes to infinity. And the denominator is 1 minus a half. What is that equal to? Well, it's just 1 in the numerator divided by 1 half in the denominator, which is 2. That's a specific number. Does the first answer work? Well, as n gets really big, you're still adding terms to the partial sums. 1 over 1,024 is still bigger than 0. So the partial sums always grow by less and less, but they keep growing. It doesn't go to 0. You just said it went to 2. 
and it doesn't go to infinity, because 2 is not infinity. So the only correct answer is the second one. Right. Rather than going off to infinity, this series approaches a specific number. Let's take a look. The first partial sum is 1. The second is 1.5. The third is 1.75. A4 is 1.875. A5 is 1.9375. And A11 is about 1.999. These partial sums are getting closer and closer to 2. And that's what it means to call a series convergent. It means that the partial sums are approaching a single finite value. We say it's finite because for a series to be convergent, it can't go off to infinity. And the series 1 plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth and so on is convergent since the partial sums approach 2. If you were to add up the infinitely many terms in this series, you would say that the sum of this infinite geometric series is exactly 2. Meanwhile, a divergent series is one whose partial sums don't approach a single value, or whose partial sums go off to plus or minus infinity. And the geometric series with r equals 2 is an example of a divergent series. If you keep adding up larger and larger powers of 2, the partial sums go to infinity. Let's look at one last example, a series in which the nth term is equal to minus 1 to the nth power. Minus 1 to an odd power is still minus 1, while minus 1 to an even power equals positive 1. So this series is equal to minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, and so on. Is this an example of a convergent or divergent series? Let's take a look at the partial sums for this series. The first partial sum coming from this is just minus 1. The second partial sum coming from the sum of the first two terms is 0. The third one is minus 1 and the fourth one is zero again. Now, it's tempting to say that the series doesn't diverge, it converges to something like zero or minus one, but the problem is it doesn't actually get closer and closer to zero or closer and closer to minus one. There will always be terms that are far from zero, namely minus one, and there will always be terms that are far from minus one, namely zero. So this particular series doesn't converge. And whenever something doesn't converge, that means it diverges. It always has to do one or the other. Right. This one is divergent. To see why, let's look at the partial sums. a1 is minus 1. a2 is minus 1 plus 1, so that's 0. a3 is again minus 1 a4 is 0, and this switching off between minus 1 and 0 keeps going, and continues forever if the series is infinite. While the partial sums don't go off to plus or minus infinity, they never converge to a single value, so this series is still divergent. In the next few tutorials, we'll look at different series and find ways to determine if they're convergent or divergent. Here we'll work out a formula for finding the sum of infinite geometric series. Series can be convergent or divergent. Here's an example of a divergent geometric series. If you add up all the terms, it goes to positive infinity. And here's an example of a convergent geometric series. If you add up all the terms here, the sum of this series approaches 2. Let's work out a formula for finding the sums of convergent geometric series that have infinitely many terms. Here's our typical geometric series. It starts with a, and each term in the series is equal to the previous term times the number r. So we have a plus ar plus ar squared, and so on, up to a times r to the n minus 1. There are a total of n terms here, so if we extended this series infinitely, we would call this the nth partial sum, or a n. Which of the following is an expression for the partial sum a n in terms of little a, r, and n? This formula was derived in another tutorial. It's the first term, little a, times 1 minus r to the n in the numerator, divided by 1 minus r 
and the denominator. The thing to remember with this formula is that the power of r in the numerator here is always one bigger than the power of r in the last term here. So if this was n instead of n minus 1, this would have been n plus 1 instead of n. Okay, now suppose we want to find the sum of an infinite geometric series. Which of the following is a formula for the sum of an infinite geometric series? If we had a sub 10, big A sub 10, we're going to add the first 10 terms. It's a plus ar plus everything up to a times r to the ninth. But that's not quite an infinite series. a sub 100 is a little closer because we're adding up a plus ar plus ar to the ninth, but then we keep going up to ar to the 99th. If we had a sub 1,000, it would be even closer because we'd have a plus ar plus everything up to a times r to the 999. So we'd be adding up 1,000 terms. If we really want to get an infinite series, we need to take a sub n, and we want n to be really, really big. So we want the limit as n goes to infinity. That's that guy there. Right. A n is a partial sum that represents the sum of the first n terms in this series. So if we take the limit as n goes to infinity, then we'll be adding up all of the infinitely many terms in the infinite series. Now, under what conditions will an infinite geometric series converge? An infinite geometric series converges whenever this limit is finite. Let's write the limit out here. It's the limit as n goes to infinity of little a times 1 minus r to the n, all divided by 1 minus r. The only place n appears in this limit is in this term here. So let's figure out when that's going to converge and diverge. If r is big, say r is bigger than 1, what's going to happen? Well, if we take big numbers and raise them to higher and higher powers, we're going to get bigger and bigger numbers. So the sequence is going to diverge. Now, actually, we only care about big numbers, including big negative numbers. If you take negative 4 and raise it to higher and higher powers, it's also going to diverge. So let's just put absolute values around this R to take both situations into account. What happens if we take a small number and raise it to higher and higher powers? Well, if we take a small number, like a half or 0.8 or anything less than 1, and raise it to a bigger and bigger power, we're going to get 0 eventually. So the sequence on the left is going to converge. Finally, what happens if r is equal to 1, or if the size of r is equal to 1? Now there's two cases. If r is equal to 1, our sequence looks like a plus a plus a plus a, and that's going to diverge as long as a isn't 0. If r equals minus 1, it's going to be a and then minus 1 times a, which is minus a, and then r squared times a is going to be plus a again, and it's going to alternate between a and minus a. Now, the partial sums for that series switch between a and 0, but that still means they diverge. Again, as long as a is in 0. So the only time we're guaranteed to converge is when r is less than 1, or the size of r is less than 1. Great, now let's see how you got that. We said the sum of an infinite series is the limit of the nth partial sum, a n, as n goes to infinity. We said a n is equal to this expression here, a times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. So taking the limit as n goes to infinity of a n means we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity for this expression as well. And now if r is less than 1, then raising r to the nth power where n is a really, really big number, will kill this term. Try raising a number between 0 and 1 to higher and higher powers, and you'll see that it goes to 0. If r is bigger than 1, then r to the n gets bigger as you increase the power n, 
making this whole expression bigger and bigger, causing the series to diverge. So infinite geometric series converge when r is less than 1. Let's come up with an exact formula for what they converge to by simplifying this expression. Can you evaluate this limit? The only place n appears in this limit is in this term here. If we have a small number r, say the absolute value of r is less than 1, what happens when we raise it to a very, very large power, say r to the n, as n goes to infinity? Well, bigger and bigger powers of small numbers get closer and closer to 0, so this is going to approach 0. What are we left with for the limit then? Well, we have a times 1 minus 0, over 1 minus r, which we can write as a over 1 minus r. Right. In the limit of large n, we said that r to the n goes to 0, when r is less than 1. So when we take this limit, we can replace the r to the n with a 0. 1 minus 0 is still 1, and we're multiplying this fraction by a, so let's move the a over to the numerator. And that's it. The sum of an infinite geometric series is a over 1 minus r, where a is the first term in the series, and r is the ratio between neighboring terms in the series. This formula is worth memorizing. It's pretty short, and it comes into play almost every time you see a geometric series. But remember, it only works when r is less than 1. When r is greater than or equal to 1, the infinite geometric series will diverge. Try out this last example. What's the sum of the infinite geometric series 3 plus 3 fifths plus 3 twenty fifths plus 3 over 125, and so on? To evaluate this geometric series, we can use this formula. What we need to find out are a, little a, and little r. Little a is the first term. In this case, it's 3, so little a is equal to 3, and r is the ratio between subsequent terms. So we can take the second term, say a sub 2, and divide it by the first term, a sub 1, to get little r. Here, that's 3 fifths divided by the first term, which is 3, or 1 fifth. Once we have little a and little r, we can just plug them in to find the sum. So the sum, I'll call it a infinity, for the infinity of the partial sum is little a, which is 3, over 1 minus little r, which is a fifth. It's 3 over 4 fifths, which is equal to 15 over 4. In this tutorial, we'll introduce another kind of series, called an arithmetic geometric series. Here's an example of an arithmetic geometric series. Why do you think we're calling this an arithmetic geometric series? The numerators and the denominators here seem to have two different patterns. The numerators increase by 1 every time we go to the next term in the series. The denominators get multiplied by 2 every time we go to the next term in the series. So the numerators, if they're increasing by 1, are arithmetic. The denominators, if they get multiplied by a constant number every time we go to the next term, are geometric. Right. The numerators are an arithmetic sequence, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. The denominators, meanwhile, are a geometric sequence. Each denominator is twice the previous one. It turns out that this sum converges. If you add up just the five terms shown here, what's the sum?
To evaluate this finite sum, we can just rewrite it with a common denominator of 16. So we're left with 1 plus 2 over 2, which is also 1, plus 3 fourths, plus 4 eighths, which is a half, plus 5 sixteenths. The top is 32, plus 12 is 44, plus 8 is 52, plus 5 is 57. So it's 57 over 16. Now let's try to figure out exactly what the sum of the infinite series is equal to. To do that, we'll divide up these fractions. First, we'll keep 1 over 1 as 1 over 1. Next, we'll split up the two halves into two copies of 1 half. We can similarly split the 3 quarters into 3 copies of 1 quarter. 4 eighths becomes 4 copies of 1 eighth, and 5 sixteenths can be split up into 5 copies of 1 sixteenth. We could keep splitting up all the terms of this series up here, but for now, let's just look at the terms we've already shown here. Now let's find the sum of each of the rows here. What's the sum of this first row? 1 plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth and so on. It's a geometric series, right? The infinite series in this question is a geometric series. The first term, call it little a, is just 1, and the ratio between terms, we can take the second term divided by the first term, for instance, is a half. Every term is a half as big as the previous term. What's the sum for an infinite geometric series? Well, it's the first term over 1 minus the ratio. In that case, it's 1 over 1 minus a half, which is 2. Exactly right. The sum of this first row is 2. What's the sum of the second row? Again, we have an infinite geometric series the first term is a half. The ratio between terms is a half again. You can take the second term divided by the first term, a fourth divided by a half, and you'll get a half. The sum of an infinite geometric series is the first term over 1 minus the ratio, and in this case, it's a half over 1 minus a half, which is a half over a half, which is 1. Yes, the second row adds up to 1. What about the third row? This series is another geometric series. The first term is a fourth now, and the ratio between terms is, say, the second term divided by the first term, which is a half. So what's the sum? We'll call it the infinity of the partial sum. It's the first term over 1 minus the ratio, which is a fourth divided by a half, which is a half. Right again. And the fourth row adds up to a fourth, and the fifth row, which is the geometric series 1 16th plus 1 over 32 plus 1 over 64 and so on, adds up to an eighth. And these geometric series keep going. If we had split up more terms from the arithmetic geometric series up here, 
we'd have more geometric series down here that we'd be adding up. So this arithmetic geometric series up here also turns out to be the sum of 2 plus 1 plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth and so on. And this is another geometric series. So what's the sum of this one? What kind of infinite series is this? Well, every term is a half as big as the previous term. So it's another geometric series where the first term is 2. The ratio between terms, say a2 over a1, it's the easiest way to find the ratio, is a half. That means the sum, the infinity of the partial sum of this series, is the first term, 2 over 1 minus r, which is a half, or 2 over a half, which is 4. Right, the sum of this series is 4. So that's the sum of this arithmetic geometric series. It converges to 4. Finally, here are some basic rules about arithmetic geometric series. Their numerators are arithmetic, while their denominators are geometric, and those denominators have to be increasing, like in the example up here. Arithmetic geometric series always converge, and you can find their sum by rewriting them as multiple geometric series, just like we did for this one.